We can talk this morning. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. And you can come out and we can spend this time together. Today's a special day. We haven't had a potluck in like forever because of this old COVID thing. So uh, for the first time in a long time, after the service this morning, and I'll try and remember to pray for the food. Will that work before we go? And that way you can just go back and begin eating. And then we have our business meeting uh, today, our quarterly business meeting that we have. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad you're here. You're welcome to stay for the potluck. You can skip the business or whatever you want to do, but you're sure welcome to stay and to, to eat with us if you if you would like. There's a tear-off sheet on that order of worship there for you. Uh, it's Again, it's for prayer request needs, uh, visitation needs. Please use that and put it in the offering plate a little bit later. But before uh, you fold it up, there's a memory verse on there. We have a new memory verse every month, and we'll go over that uh, in a second. Ladies, Bible studies, again, are all listed here for you. Our Wednesday night program's uh, still going on on the back. Uh, mark your calendars uh, for some uh, dates uh, coming up, and uh, everything is pretty much listed there for you. Okay, business meeting, guy. what am I forgetting? All right. Uh, everything then is there. Let's look at that memory verse uh, this morning. And uh, if you'd say with me again that reference before and after. First John 3.17. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? First John 3.17. Okay, our children this morning have a lesson for us. Hey, Molly. Hey, George. Glad you could be here today. Hey, Libby. Hey, Libby. I am so excited to learn about being a disciple for Jesus today. Wait, what? What do you mean? You know, George. I told you last week in Children's Church that today we were going to be learning about what it means to be a disciple. You said disciple? Of course she did. Uh-oh. Well, what do you mean, uh-oh? And what in the world is in that bag you've got there? I, um, well, are you sure you said disciples? I could have sworn you said recycles. I spent all week long looking for things that we can recycle. In the world will we be talking about recycling in church? Are you from outer space? Well, aren't we supposed to keep God's planet clean? You've got a point there, George. But that's not our subject today. Today, we're talking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. The word disciple comes from the word discipline. I don't like discipline. Me neither. It's not the discipline of punishment that you probably have in mind. The word disciple comes from the Latin word meaning student. Ooh, I've always wanted to speak a new language. You're not going to learn a new language, but the origin of a word sometimes helps us to understand it better. So when we talk about being disciples of Jesus, that means that we are his students. And as his students, we have much to learn. How do you think we learn about Jesus? Oh, oh, I know, I know. We must read and know God's word. Know it all. That's right, Molly. When Jesus lived on earth, he chose 12 disciples, or 12 students, to learn from him. Over the course of three years, Jesus taught them and many other people what it means to follow and please God. Wait just a minute. They only had they only had to go to school for 3 years as students. That's not fair. They make us go for like a bazillion zillion years. George, it wasn't that kind of school. Jesus was just teaching them through his example and lessons in life. That's right. And you know what? When Jesus' time on earth was over, he left the disciples with some very important instructions. Probably some of the most important instructions ever. Really? Yep. And it wasn't just for the disciples. It's for us today as well. Oh, I've heard about this before. Wasn't it called the Great Conversation? Ha! I don't think that's quite right. Although you would think so since all you like to do is have conversations. I don't think you ever quit talking, Molly. I do too. That's enough. And you were pretty close, Molly. It was called the Great Commission, and it's found in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. 
It's where Jesus visited his disciples after he rose from the grave and gave them a very special message. In verses 19 through 20, Jesus told them, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Wow, I just realized something really important. What's that, Molly? If Jesus' disciples hadn't obeyed his teaching, we probably wouldn't even be here today reading God's word or even knowing about God. Jesus' disciples taught other people, and those people taught other people, and those people taught other people, and those Okay, people okay, I think we get the point. But you're so right, Molly. We know about God today because of all the disciples that came before us. I guess that means we have the responsibilities to tell others about Jesus too so that those who come after us can also learn about Jesus love salvation and forgiveness that's exactly right George as students of Jesus we must teach others what we've learned from the Bible I love the promise that God gives us at the end of that command he will be with us always yes that's a wonderful promise he's gonna be right beside us helping us every step of the way bye <laughs> Please stand and turn to number 56, To God Be the Glory. the people rejoice. Oh, come through the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of love to Please be seated. Well, 
Our scripture reading this morning is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. If you'd like to be turning there, uh, as we look at that passage uh, together this morning as we, we begin. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. And while you're... Uh, Looking there, some prayer requests I forgot to announce. They're on your prayer request list, but to bring your attention to, be praying for Ben Simmons and, of course, his mommy and dad. Uh, he's got the COVID-19 and the double pneumonia with that. So be praying for Ben and his family. Uh, uh, Margie uh, Melton, continue to heal up. Uh, Gene, continue to pray and for Gene as he uh, undergoes these treatments. Uh, Mary Childress is going to be going to a group home. She's kind of excited about that, maybe praying about about that and of course it's going to be a transition and everything there and then Elaine I understand hurt her arm be praying for there and then Alyssa is the reason that Fred and Chris aren't here this morning has got some kind of infection you know she had a c-section and there can be some things following the birth of a child that way so hopefully it's not about that but uh, be praying for them so lots on your prayer request list this morning and we'll pray about those things here a little bit later uh, second Kings chapter 4 beginning with verse 42 uh, a man came from Baal Shalishaha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. Well, how can I set this before a hundred men? His servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat. For this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate, and they had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Please stand as we sing number 769. Oh, that will be glory. Be seated. And again, as always, before we let our kids go to their time together, 
As we approach God's Word, as we always should, we approach it in prayer. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for we can gather here today. Sun shining, dear Lord. Beautiful place that you've made available for us to gather for a little while. And again, later today, to partake of a meal together as your children. Thank you, dear God, for all your grace, your mercy, your compassions, dear Lord, that you, you throw out upon us, dear Lord, in abundance, dear Father. We thank you for that, that we can come together for a little time. And again, we pray for a little while to be able to shut out the busyness of this old world and all the turmoil that is going on around us outside the doors of this church and come together and to worship you, to praise you, to thank you, and to draw strength from you and from each other, dear Lord, as we come and gather around your, your word this morning. So again, we just praise you for that. We pray for those that can't be here this morning, dear Lord. Many are sick, many at home, dear Lord. Again, we pray for them. We know you've heard these names that we, we read this morning. There's many others that we could add, add to that list, dear Lord, that just don't feel very well this morning. So we pray that as your Holy Spirit ministers to our hearts and minds this morning, that you minister to them. That your Holy Spirit minister to them spiritually, dear Lord, that they know your presence, that they know that you know what it is that they're facing in their lives. We pray that they would seek you in, in big ways with their whole heart, dear Lord, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would touch their bodies and heal them up and restore them to us, dear Lord. That the grace and peace that we talk about this morning will not be things that we talk about, be things that we experience in our lives as we draw close to you. Thank you for that privilege this morning. None of these things, dear God, we deserve. Thank you for saving sinners such as us. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, our kids can be dismissed with uh, their teachers this morning and their helpers. for their lesson. <laughs> now last time together, we introduced Peter's second letter. And in those three introductory verses, Peter tells us that we already have everything we need for life and godliness. We have the very righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ that imputed righteousness because of his death and his resurrection. You have forgiveness and freedom from guilt, the guilt of your sins. You have already received a precious faith. We are given a grace and a peace in abundance, he told us. In abundance, overflowing. Think of that horn of plenty that we put up here on Thanksgiving. A horn of plenty full of grace and peace. Overflowing. And all of that is through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As we learn about God. As we learn about Him not only academically or scholastically, but as we walk with Him personally and experience Him in our lives. And we are then partakers of the divine power that is the Holy Spirit that does a work in transforming us in our lives and saving us by that same divine power of the Holy Spirit. We already have everything we need. Now Peter, in verses 4 through 9 of this second epistle that we're studying, having finished 1 Peter, tells us about great and precious promises that he has given us. So let's read that text, verses 4 through 9, what we're going to look at this morning for the sake of time. Verse 4, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. 
For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Let's break this down a little bit this morning before we put it back together. In verse 4, by these or through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. Now there's a whole lot in this one verse. And I know when sometimes we just read scriptures, we can kind of glance over these things. Through or by these? Well, the question then is, these what? Well, it's what he said before in verses 1 through thee. By these, by the righteousness that has been given you, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, this precious faith, by the unmerited, undeserved grace or gift of God, by this peace, shalom, that he has given you in abundance, and by the knowledge of God and knowing about him and his son Jesus Christ and learning about him and his divine power being a partaker of the Holy Spirit. Everything you need are these things. He has given us, through these things, His very great and precious promises. Or, as the New American Standard Bible would translate it, His precious and magnificent promises. These promises are pretty important. They're a key to a productive, effective life in Jesus Christ. And the reason he gave us these things is so that we might, two things this morning I want to talk about, be like Jesus. That's what it means when it says partaker of the divine nature. That the nature of Jesus, the godly nature of Jesus, the righteous nature of Jesus, you might be a partaker in that. You might be like Jesus, which is our ultimate destiny, as I've told you before. You are destined to be transformed into the very image of Christ. And when we stand before him, we will be like him. Well, if that's our ultimate destiny, then we ought to head that way. And that's what Peter's talking about. This is how you head that way. If that's where you're going to end up, might as well go that way now. Why put it off? And secondly, not only that you might be like Jesus, partaking in the divine nature, but you might also escape the corruption, the ungodliness, the wickedness, the meanness that is in the world caused by the flesh, carnal desires, or worldly desires, or fleshly desires. So there is a way to escape the evil that's in the world. Because there's really two worlds here. We talked about it in Sunday school. Living in the kingdom in which Christ is our king, even though our feet may be in this world. We can escape the corruption of that world by our heads being in the heavenlies. The question here is, is do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to be transformed into his likeness by the Holy Spirit of God as you grow and mature, partaking of the divine nature of God himself? Becoming God-like. And do you want to know how you can escape all the evil and ungodliness and wickedness that is in the world? Second point this morning. It's up to you. That's right. It's up to you. You have to exercise some due diligence. Let me explain. Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort... That's tough. You just don't accidentally be con conformed to the image or partaker of the very nature of God. You have to exercise every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. You are to add these things. Nobody else can do that for you. If you want to be a partaker of the divine nature, and if you want to escape the corruption that's in the world, you and you alone need to exercise due diligence, I call it. Make every effort, which is exercising a due diligence. 
making every effort to add these things to your faith. And as I said, nobody can do that for you. You can't go to the Christian bookstore and buy a DVD. Poof. Transformed. You don't catch it going to church. You have to exercise every effort. It requires your effort in applying this due diligence to the task. And the word every effort implies haste, running out of time, eagerness, determination, due diligence. Now, you wonder why folks who call themselves Christians don't look much like Christ. You ever wonder that? They don't, they don't act like Christ very much. And some that do, that act, that's hypocrisy. Well, maybe they have never added to their faith these things that pertain to godliness. They've never let God transform their lives into them to be partakers of the divine nature because they have never exercised due diligence. They got a ticket to heaven, got some water thrown on them, and all I got to do is go to church, right? As he said in verses 1 through 3, you already have everything you need. You just need to exercise due diligence to add these seven qualities to those things that God in Christ has already given to you. Add to your righteousness, to your faith, to your grace and peace, to your knowledge of God and His divine power, which is everything you need. Make every effort. Exert yourself. It's work. To add these seven qualities, if, and it's a big if, you'd be like Jesus and partaker of the divine nature, and if you would escape the corruption that's in the world. If you would model a life of Jesus. But let's come back to that. Well, let me give you an illustration. There was a, a show on TV a while back about a little girl who firemen, or actually all, a lot of first responders, had come out and rescued her and her family from a house fire. And in an interview, and there's a little gal, they ask her, you know, about what she, and she told them, when I grow up, I want to be a fireman, a policeman, and a, and a paramedic. Well, now why did she want, because they saved her life, and they saved the life of her family. She wants to be like them. Now, see, we're talking about a different time. Let's go back to Peter's day, to the Christians he talked to. They didn't like this world very much, and this world didn't like them. Nero's burnt Rome. Persecution's been turned up. Peter will be killed not long after this letter. They weren't living for this world. And they loved their Savior who died for them, and they wanted to be like Jesus. Whoa, that's a prerequisite to these things. But what about folks that don't want to be like Jesus? I mean, he was a little radical in his religious teachings. I mean, I want a ticket to heaven. Right? You know, I, I want to go be a Christian as long as it requires me just to go to church and put some money in the offering plate once in a while. That's okay, but <laughs> don't want to get carried away with being like Jesus. They wanted to be like the Savior that saved them. They wanted to emulate them in, his, in their lives. That's what the word Christians came from. They were being mocked because it means little Christians, little Christs. Oh, you're just a bunch of little Christs. They wanted to be little Christs. But is it necessarily something we see today? You see, there's the rub. No, no, I just, I just want to go to church. And I kind of like the world. I don't want to totally escape the corruption that's in the world. I want to play with it a little bit. I want to live with one foot in the world Monday through Saturday and, and then just go to church on Sunday. Oh, so you're not going to exercise due diligence? Every effort... To be like Jesus because you don't really want to be like him anyway? Because to be like Jesus in this world doesn't usually turn out too good. It didn't turn out too good for Peter, and it didn't turn out too good for Jesus, did it? When you're light in a dark place, and when you're salt as a preserving element in a decaying society, if you want to escape the corruption of this world, if you want to be like Jesus, add to your faith and exercise due diligence to do that goodness. What is goodness? Goodness is moral excellence, virtue. 
It implies moral fortitude and courage, uh, you know, the ability based on internal motivations and strength to do what's right and to stand alone if necessary. As I told you, one of my favorite old Mark Twain quotes is, always do what's right. It will amaze some people and astonish the rest. Add to your faith goodness. Add to your goodness knowledge, gnosis. Knowledge is that which is learned by study, investigation, observation, and experience. Growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's work. It's not just studying the Word and listening to and being taught by the Holy Spirit. But it's walking with Jesus in an intimate relationship, gaining a personal knowledge about Him. Again, our pietist heritage says it's not just about the academics. you got to get what you know in here. From head to your heart. And then it shows in your hands. Knowledge, experiential, as well as knowledge through study. In Philippians 3.8, and we talked about this new attitude. What is more, Paul said, I consider everything a loss... Because the surpassing work of knowing of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. It was a priority in his life to know him. You also find that can be a painful experience in some cases because you know the more you know about God and the more you know about Jesus, the more you know about yourself. And he begins to reveal things in your life that you need to give to him on the altar of sacrifice. Knowledge. We're going to sing about it. We started to sing about it. More and more about Jesus. I wonder what that writer had in mind of some of these teachings of, of Peter here. It's about growing in grace and knowledge. More, more about Jesus. More what I know. And he's talking about that adding to your faith these things. Add to your goodness that knowledge. Add to your knowledge self-control. That Greek word is, is to control oneself. Not blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Or the latest fad that comes down the Christian pike. Or a crisis theology or being stampeded by the crowd. Self-control. Being in tune with heaven and God's voice, voice alone. Eyes on the Lord. Head in the book. Not letting others control or move you. Not controlled by money, sex, power, drugs, the flesh. But disciplined. Self-control. Add to that self-control perseverance. Just keep on keeping on. On that narrow path or the narrow way. Focused on the holy city. Not drawn off to the right or to the left. Not discouraged by valley or mountaintop. Steadfast. Stable. Even in the midst of distress, hardship, and disaster. As the very Christians he's writing to would face the very wrath of Rome. But they persevered. They just kept on keeping on, doing what they know God would have them to do, and witnessing and testifying that Jesus died, rose again, and let me tell you about how he saved me and the hope that I have. And for that they would be killed, which is where the word for witness became, the, which is the word martyrie. It didn't mean getting killed or being a martyr, but because so many of those who witnessed to what Jesus had done for them ended up getting killed, the, the word witness became associated with martyrdom. Even though it doesn't mean that. There was a camp lesson, and I missed it. So I had to have my granddaughter tell me about it. Uh, I didn't get to attend a lot of camp. wasn't feeling too good. But what little I did get to go, one of the ones I've missed that I really wanted was the wise man, right? Who built his house upon the rock. And the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Building your life on God, you persevere, right? When the storm came and the winds blow, the house on the sand didn't do too good. When the rains came, and I bought 16 squirt guns. So if you can imagine 16 squirt guns uh, going off on these two houses made up of kids, uh, and the one fell down, but the other one stood through the rain uh, and, and through the wind. I'm sorry I missed that. I would have loved to have seen that. I heard it got a little wild. That's what Rebecca said. It got wild. Okay, But that's what he's talking about here. Persevering through that. 
like the old U.S. post office motto, neither snow nor rain, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from their uh, swift completion of their appointed rounds. Perseverance. Add to your perseverance godliness, authentic piety, true spirituality from the heart as opposed to some dead external religion. A God-likeness. God who is love. God who is merciful and, and gracious and compassionate and forgiving to sinners. Godliness. Add to your godliness brotherly kindness. That's our word Philadelphia. Phileo love. Brotherly love. A life of love. Being kind. Being nice. Be respectful of each other. Christianity is all about the love. And add to that brotherly kindness, that phileo love, agape love. Agape love is, is the love that it described when it says that God is love. God is agape. The love that goes out and doesn't expect anything in return. In ancient, in literature, in, in, in dry, we, we call that unrequited love in romance. Where somebody loves somebody else deeply, even though they know that love will never come back to them. And God's got no guarantee. He sent His Son of the world to die for us. Not because we were forced to love Him back. He had no false expectations of that. Perchance we might love Him back. He was willing to die for us. That kind of love. Loving others. Loving sinners. Loving broken people. Like God loves people. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A sacrificial love. And by the way, that love hurts many times. If you look at the wall behind me at that cross, that's God's love. Did that hurt a little bit? Was, was that a sacrifice? Those who mocked him and made fun of him, and yet he said... Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's love. Add to your brotherly love, agape love. Exercise due diligence. Make every effort to add to your faith these seven virtues of goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Which brings us back to the question, do you really want to be like Jesus? Do you want to escape the corruption that's in the world? In order to do that, Peter says, you need to exercise due diligence. You need to roll up your sleeves and go to work. Adding these seven virtues to your faith. And the explanation is found in that last part in verses 8 and 9. My final point this morning, I call it the big if. For if, here it is, the big if. For if you exercise this due diligence, for if you possess, you own these qualities in increasing measure. You see, the Christian life is never done. You know, you, you get saved. A lot of churches tell you, you know, you get saved, you get your little, little certificate, you get some water thrown on you, all you got to do is come to church, right? No, 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 that's just the beginning you see, as you grow in these things in ever increasing measure, growing up into the fullness of what God would have you to be, uh, inculcating these virtues in your life, in ever increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Barren, without fruit. You know, the Bible uses that illustration of agriculture a lot of times. You know, the tree that you go to and doesn't have any fruit growing on it, but it looks like there should be fruit, but there's no fruit. Because it became unproductive. But if these virtues you're adding to your life in ever increasing measure, you will never be ineffective. And you will never be unfruitful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing Him in a personal relationship of intimacy and of love produces fruit. John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches, one of my favorite pieces of poetry in the New Testament. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall bear, what? Much fruit. It's the natural outflow 
of growing in these virtues. And again, you know what folks substitute for a growing, living relationship with Jesus Christ? A religion. A religion. Just do some, keep some traditions. Do a religion. But, by contrast, verse 9, but, if anyone does not have them, those seven virtues, he's nearsighted, he's blind, and he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. In other words, he's still struggling in the flesh. He's still struggling over past sins and the guilt of the past. He's looking backwards. He's not looking forward. Or as we're going to sing this morning, he's not moving on to higher ground. New heights I'm gaining every day. I'm pressing on the upward way. He's still there in the past. Oh, he got his ticket to heaven and joined a religion, but where's the transformation that takes place in one's life? As we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter's call is to why wallow in a valley of, of ineffective and unproduct, an unproductive life, being nearsighted and blind, when you can exercise due diligence, adding these virtues more and more, and you can press on that upward, upward way, gaining new heights every day. And by way of conclusion this morning, this journey all begins by as easy as ABC, agreeing with God that we are broken sinners, ragamuffin sinners. So broken, we don't know how broken we are. We don't know how sinful we are. We're so sinful, we don't know how sinful we are. I don't. And then believing that he did for us exactly what he said he did for us. Shed his blood that our sins might be forgiven. That he loved the unlovely. That he came to, to save sinners. And he rose again that I might have eternal life and an eternal kingdom being transformed into his very, his very image. Believe in the good news. The definition of which is found in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died according to the Scriptures. That He was buried, He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Simply believing that He didn't lie to you. He did for you what He said He did for you. And finally and ultimately, confessing Him as your Lord. Putting Him back where He belongs in your life. Giving Him the lead. To follow Him and to be like Him as you follow Him until that day you stand in His presence perfectly conformed to His very image. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's sing this morning as we uh, sing about that higher ground if we exercise due diligence. And in turn to number 549, Higher Ground. Oh, 
joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's stable land. As always, God's invitation is open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But if we can help you in seeking God or finding in your Bible about this thing and being born again and becoming God's child, ask me, one of the men and women of this church, and we'll be glad to sit down with you and try and help you find the answers to your questions in God's holy word. Um, let's, uh, uh, before I read the words of the benediction and you are dismissed this morning, let's pray for our time of, of fellowship together and for the meal so you can be dismissed and everybody is welcome to stay to go back and get something to eat and spend a time of, of fellowship. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this time together in this beautiful place that our elders and forefathers have built for us, dear Father, to come and to enjoy the fruits and works uh, of their labors, dear Lord. So we thank you for the business we have to conduct your blessings to us the way you've taken care of us and continue to take care of us and we thank you for this meal that we've come together to partake and to uh, spend a little time as your children do before you uh, this morning so again your time on this blessing after church this morning in jesus name we pray amen a benediction taken from the book of jude now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish holy before the presence of his glory with rejoicing to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. We're dismissed.